Hi, Rupert. It's a great joy to be with you. Very nice to meet you in this way. Yeah, we are on similar paths, and I guess... we're on a similar path. Yes, yeah. <laughs> A lot of um, things we agree on, uh, maybe all the things actually, it's wonderful. Rupert Spira is an international teacher of Advaita Vedanta, and it's wonderful to have somebody who has thought so deeply about the nature of life, the ultimate reality and its significance in making life better for everyone. And it's a joy to be discussing with you on this platform where actually, uh, as you can see, as you know, it's called consciousness is all there is. <laughs> and that goes along very much the same line of your thinking. So we very want much, to explore yeah. these different values. Welcome to our program. It's a joy to have you. Thank you. Well, it's a joy to be here, Tony. Thank you for, for inviting me. Vedanta. Vedanta, we should maybe define it, even though many of our listeners are already familiar with the term. I'll just make an attempt, and then we will dive deeper into its uh, contents and its inspiration, and where does it lead us practically. Veda is a term that means knowledge. It's the ancient science, if you like, that comes from deep intuition internal exploration, introspection, and uh, knowledge from a different perspective than what we usually say as objective knowledge, which means the knowledge of science that looks at objectivity, at objects as being separate from the subject and study them. Uh, and the observer, the scientist likes to stay away from the object because might interfere with the observation, might have their opinion. So this is a very valid approach to knowledge, to science. And that is the knowledge that comes from consciousness itself, from awareness itself, and awareness can be at different levels. Veda is one of those aspects of knowledge that is not based on specific experimentation, although it leads itself to a lot of analysis and science and uh, its programs, its uh, suggestions can be analyzed theoretically and practically, but it comes from this knowledge that is intuitive in a sense, a knowledge of inspiration, of cognition, of higher philosophical uh, value. And Veda has, as defined by uh, recently by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the sage who came from this Vedic tradition, has 40 aspects. And these aspects include various parts of literature. And among them, there is what we call the Upangas. Upangas are the supportive limbs of the Veda, of this whole Veda. And the Upangas have six parts. They have been also called the six systems of Indian philosophy. And they are Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Yoga. Yoga, I stop at yoga because it is very <laughs> familiar today. Then uh, yoga means unity, unifying value. Then comes Karma Mimansa, which is the analysis of action, the analysis of the dynamics of natural law, or we can call of consciousness. And we can discuss also this, whether consciousness is a flat absolute, does it have dynamics within it, and how the dynamics emerge and how they manifest. And then actually the Veda comes to what it calls the end of the Veda. Veda Anta, Anta means end, so the end of the Veda. <laughs> And that is not the end in a negative way, in the sense that it's finished, it's over. But I guess, um, uh, Rupert, you will agree, it means the fulfillment of understanding, coming to the fullness of realization of the ultimate reality. And that is Vedanta. Now, Vedanta has different interpretations uh, also, there are Dvaitic, which means those who believe in dual nature. 
and there are Advaitic, non-dualist. And Rupert is in the heart of the Advaitic Vedantic tradition. So having taken your time, which you could have done this as an explanation in a, in a probably more wonderful way, but Rupert, tell us what is Advaita Vedanta from your perspective and the philosophy that life offers uh, through Advaita Vedanta. I agree with you, as you suggested, Tony, that uh, Vedanta is, is not the not the end of knowledge in the sense of the, the, the determination of knowledge, but is the is the culmination, the fulfillment, the the highest knowledge. And if we were to try to express this ultimate knowledge in words, of course, ultimately it can't be expressed, but if we were to try to express it in words, in fact, if we were to take uh, the last uh, two and a half thousand years of uh, Vedantic uh, philosophy, understanding, practice, and, and distill it into a single sentence. It might sound something like this. Uh, peace and happiness are the nature of our being, and we share our being with everyone and everything. That's Vedanta. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. I guess you might be referring to also the statement Satchit Ananda, which is the nature of the absolute in Sanskrit. Yes, Sat, um, as, as, as you well know, meaning being, Chit meaning uh, consciousness, awareness or, or knowing, and, and Ananda, peace, joy. So th this, this, these three words are, in, are the, the, this um, beautiful, um, condensed, phrase in which the entire non-dual or uh, Advaita teaching, the Advaita understanding is expressed, uh, Satchitananda, namely uh, the knowing of being is happiness itself. Beautiful. So the self. knowing of being, uh, as you as you said, uh, science is, is concerned with knowledge of the known, Vedanta is concerned with knowledge of the knower because um, everything we know about the known can only ever be as good as our knowledge of the knower. And therefore, to know anything about the known, in other words, the universe, we first have to know the nature of the knower with which it is known. And therefore, this exploration of the nature of that which knows, that which we call I, is, is really the highest science and the ultimate knowledge. And that's why um, Sat Chitananda, the, the knowing of being, that is the knowing of the subject, the knowing of who I am, the knowing of who I am is, is peace itself. So contained in these three words is this beautiful understanding that uh, the, the peace, the joy for which everybody longs above all else resides in our being. And if, if we want access to that peace, we have to know the nature of our being. You have beautifully expressed how knowing the self gives bliss. And we want on to the second aspect that you mentioned that is... Um, the fact that the nature of that reality, the nature of that ultimate reality itself is blissful, itself is joyful, it gives happiness. Yes. Would you like to comment on that? Yes. <clears throat> if we experience our own being on the inside, we tend to experience it as a peace and joy. In other words, if we go to our essential being before it is qualified by experience, that the nature of that being is peace or joy, ananda. Uh, if, we, if we approach reality by going outwards instead of by going inwards, we arrive at the same being. But uh, as, as human beings, I would suggest that we experience that being as love or beauty. It's the same 
as the peace and joy we experience on the inside. Why do I suggest that we experience it as love or beauty on the outside? Because because love, we all know that love is the is the collapse of the sense of separation, self and other, me and you. In other words, it's the collapse of the subject object relationship. So in in reality, there is no separate subject and object. Reality appears to a finite mind as subject object, but that's just the way it appears. In in reality, it is not two things, ad vita, not a subject and object. It is one, the unity of being. And love is the way, as, as human beings, love is the way we experience that unity in relation to another person. And beauty is the way we experience the same unity of being in relation to an object or nature. So the same ultimate reality is experienced as peace and joy on the inside and love and beauty on the outside. Beautiful. Um, this is uh, leads us to uh, def let's define consciousness a little bit. Uh, the nature of the ultimate reality is consciousness as is understood in Advaita Vedanta and as we teach and you propose and you teach also. And so uh, let's you know rewind a little bit and speak about non-duality because that's a very essential aspect of the Advaita, but also of the teachings that we have. The non-duality means there are no two, it's all one. And yet again, as we just discussed, we talk about object and subject from a limited perspective. Now, this ultimate reality, we are calling consciousness. Uh, it has consciousness or it is consciousness. Uh, it makes a difference because we have panpsychists, for example, that say that uh, there is something that, that is fundamental that has consciousness. And what we are saying is that it, consciousness is its nature and therefore it is consciousness. So that is the being versus the having uh, in that sense. And so you like to comment on, on this dif difference a little bit? Yes, well, a a as you know, Tony, I'm firmly in the being camp, not the having camp. And w w why is this? It is because being aware is our fundamental experience that there's no experience prior to the experience of being aware so if we propose that there is something some reality that has consciousness as one of its attributes then we should be able to isolate and observe that ultimate reality whose attribute is consciousness, before consciousness has appeared within it. Now, that, that's basically materialism. What materialism states that there is a substance, a reality, let's call it, let's call it, let's call it matter, that pre-exists consciousness and from which consciousness is derived. Well, in order to verify that, we would have to be able to find this stuff, matter, in the absence of consciousness, prior to consciousness. Well, consciousness is the prerequisite for all knowledge and experience. So it is not possible. Nobody has ever or could ever or will ever find this ultimate reality, which apparently has consciousness as its attribute because it would be possible to find that substance in the absence of consciousness. So this theory is an abstract theory that bears one, no relationship to our experience, and two, can never be verified. Why not stick with the simple facts of experience, namely that consciousness is our primary experience. Now, when I say our primary experience. I don't mean that we are one thing and that consciousness is something that we 
experience. No, we are consciousness and being conscious, being aware is consciousness is primary experience. Moreover, we can go further than that. We can also uh, acknowledge that all we ever know is the knowing of experience. So not only is conscious, I use the words consciousness and knowing synonymously, not only is consciousness our primary experience, consciousness is all that is ever experienced. Now, if that's a, a fact, I, I would suggest that was just a, 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 fa a, a fact of experience. And if we want to build a model of reality, does it not make sense to, to build our model using what we are given in our experience, namely consciousness, rather than inventing a substance that apparently lies outside consciousness that nobody has ever or could ever or will ever find to, to, to um, define reality and then to take a step further, to believe that consciousness is derived from it. It, it's like imagining that movies pre-exist the screen. Moreover, the screen emerges from the movie. It's back to front. Beautiful, beautiful. Exactly, exactly like that. And, you know, this brings to Descartes' uh, demon a little bit, uh, thinking that uh, I could doubt anything in a sense uh, maybe there is some bizarre creature who can make me believe uh, in all kinds of things but they are all illusions but there is one thing that i cannot uh, let go of and that is that i am conscious in fact he said i think therefore i am which he meant i am conscious therefore i yes. am Yes. So yes. bringing that to that to that reality. Yet he thought there were two things: that there is actually the material reality, and there is the uh, consciousness aspect. That yes. are two things. But of course, the problems in philosophy and in science and in thinking: if they were two things, how would they would interact with each other? This is one level, and the other level is. Uh, if they are one thing and it is uh, only matter, that would be the other Advaitic, but materialist Advaitic, uh, then how did Adva this create consciousness? How did lead to consciousness? This is one thing. And the other thing, as you just said, is consciousness is something we are sure about because it is through it that we apprehend and understand and compute and and, and have our a sensory experience and therefore it is in that sense also primary so there are a number of aspects that point to consciousness as not only primary but as we say consciousness as the ultimate reality now yes. that consciousness when it functions as consciousness because you can say that it's a flat absolute being which is consciousness and its nature is consciousness so when when it functions when it expresses its nature it expresses it in being conscious so we go from pure consciousness to a kind of process of being conscious and just out of simple analysis when we say i am conscious it means you are aware of something which Either it's yourself, so that is being aware of being aware, as you described in your book, or being aware of an object, or being aware of a thought, or an experience, or a memory, whatever it is. And we're calling that an object and a subject, and there must be a process that connects them. So... In the Vedic literature, and that, that was also brought to light in a beautiful way by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, it is based, the main Veda, which is Rig Veda, the, the main big Veda, as you of course know, is based, every, every aspect of it is based on three fundamental factors. They're called Rishi, Devata, and Chandas in the, in the way they, they are described. And Marshi explains this, the Rishi being the knower, 
the devata is the process of knowing and the chandas is actually the structure that hides the knower and the known which is the knower and the process and becomes the object of knowledge so in the process of being conscious we have the emergence of three values although they are only flavors within consciousness there is conceptually at least three values the value of the knower the value of the known but if the knower and the known don't come together then there is no knowing so there must be a process of knowing and the process is what links the knower to the known and that is how we come to a trinity value a three value within consciousness consciousness knowing itself comes out to be three in one value of a knower a process of knowing and the known even though the knower is the known the knower is the process and the knower is the knower of course uh, itself and so this is how uh, we propose that diversity starts from unity i want your opinion on that uh, approach <laughs> okay i noticed tony we have a, a, a very slightly different use of language um so let, let me let me uh, um really just go over what you've said in the way i would describe it and using uh, i'll use a, a, an analogy rather than a rational analysis of you as you have done which will complement your description and i think we'll find that we're saying that the same thing so rather than using a rational and a beautiful rational analysis that you gave uh, let, let's use the analogy of having a dream at night so where, where, where are you based at the moment tony where are you where are you today i'm in paris <laughs> you're in paris okay so i'm going to use that as an example so let, let's imagine that uh, you fall asleep in Paris. Now, in this analogy, by the way, you, the dreamer, I'm going to suggest that you fall asleep and have a dream. You represent infinite consciousness. So let, let's just stick with the dream, the analogy for the moment. You fall asleep in Paris and you dream that you're walking on the streets of Oxford, where, where I'm yeah. <laughs> So when you, when you fall asleep, you imagine the streets of Oxford within your own mind. But in order to view the streets of Oxford, you don't do so directly from your mind in bed in Paris. In order to view the streets of Oxford, you have to forget your dreaming. You have to forget that you're Tony in Paris. You have to simultaneously imagine the streets of Oxford and localize yourself as an apparently separate subject of experience on the streets of Oxford. And you, Tony, asleep in Paris, view the streets of Oxford from the localized perspective of the person that you seem to become in your dream. Now, in this analogy, Tony asleep in Paris represents infinite consciousness. Tony the dreamed character walking the streets of Oxford represents the finite mind. That's each of us. Now, from the point of view of Tony walking the streets of Oxford, the dreamed character, his experience, as you rightly described, is divided into three elements. I am Tony, the subject of experience walking on the streets of Oxford. There are all the buildings, people, cars, houses. Those are the objects of my experience. And the subject and the object, the knower and the known, are linked by the process of knowing or perceiving. So from the point of view of the dreamed character, Experience is divided into these three elements, the, know, the knower, the known, and the knowing that links them. Now, Tony in Paris wakes up the next morning and he thinks, oh, I just dreamt I was walking the streets of Oxford. Now, what did the streets of Oxford 
Tony the character in the dream, the knowing that joined, what did all that consist of? It was all made out of the single homogeneous, indivisible nature of Tony asleep in Paris's mind. So from the point of view of, so I would suggest that this is a, a very accurate analogy of what is taking place. Tony asleep in Paris represents infinite consciousness. There is one infinite, indivisible, homogeneous reality. And it imagines, so to speak, it imagines the universe within itself. And it simultaneously localizes itself, not just as one dreamed character, but as numerous dreamed characters. That's all of us within its own dream, from whose perspective it perceives what is in fact the activity of its own mind, but it perceives it as a physical world. Just as when you're walking on the streets of Oxford, the cars, the building, the trees, the people, they seem to be made out of stuff outside of your perceiving mind. And you call that matter. So your experience in the dream is divided into mind on the inside, and matter on the outside. But when you wake up, you think, no, it was all, it was all the same homogeneous, infinite, unnameable stuff that divided it or seemed to divide itself because your mind didn't really divide itself in two. Your mind was always one unnameable reality, but it seemed to divide itself into the subject and object. And it is that division of itself that enables it to perceive itself as manifestation. And one, one more thing to say about that is that Tony's mind asleep in Paris doesn't appear anywhere on the streets of Oxford. It doesn't, Tony's mind asleep in Paris is not in either the time or the space that seem to be real from the point of view of Tony on the streets of Oxford. In the same way, infinite consciousness is not localized in the time and space that seem to be real from our limited perspectives. It is literally out, it's not outside of time and space because that, that would put it into a spatial dimension. It, it, it has no dimensions. It only appears as four dimensions, one dimension of time and three dimensions of space when it is refracted through the prism of a finite mind. Beautiful, yes. The one unbounded ocean of consciousness remains yes. one unbounded ocean it, of consciousness. Exactly, yes. Even though it appears as many. So I am one, exactly. I can be many. And yes. it's the same one. The one doesn't lose uh, its identity as one, yet it dreams or it... Uh, I could call I would call it in my book, it has perspectives on itself. It knows yes. itself from yes. different perspectives. It, each of us, uh, that is each of us human beings and, and, and the animals and whatever other finite minds there may, may be, each of us are, are one such perspective. Exactly. And looking at each other from different, different these our own perspectives. Yes. When I look at you, Tony, I see a body. But when you close your eyes, you don't experience yourself as a body. You experience yourself as mind, thinking, feeling, sensing, perceiving. But in just the same way that when Tony on the streets of Oxford looks out on the streets of Oxford, he sees matter. But what is that matter? It's really the activity of the mind of Tony asleep in Paris. So when I look at you, I see a physical body, but what you, that's an appearance of this bundle of thinking, feeling, sensing, and perceiving that you experience on the inside. Beautiful. And that matter actually is itself as obviously because we are in Advaita and non-dualism, it's of course itself consciousness. It's also itself a bit of consciousness, if you like, yeah, that, it, has, it, it, that has its own consciousness. This is where the definition of consciousness has to be extended and we can come back to that. Yes, it, it, it's all, 
the, the apparent multiplicity and diversity that we observe in the world is how the one infinite indivisible consciousness appears from our localized perspective. So time and space uh, and, and the events and objects that arise within them, they obviously appear to us as numerous. That It's just the appearance. But, but to, every appearance has, has a, a reality that lies behind it. I'm looking at you now and behind you, I see numerous books. That's what appears to me. If I run my finger across those books, looking for numerous books, all I find is one indivisible screen, which relatively speaking is the reality of the books. Well, when we look out into the world, we see 10,000 things. There aren't really 10,000 things there. There's one thing, which is of course not a thing. It appears as many when it is refracted through a human mind, which consists of thinking and perceiving. Thinking confers names upon reality. Perceiving confers forms upon reality. So reality appears to us as names and forms. It's not names and forms. It's the one infinite, indivisible, unnameable whole. That's beautiful. However, you know, when people listen to us, if we speak about it in this particular manner, it appears that we're saying that it's all illusion, it's all a maya. This is the maya term in the Vedic literature, that it's a kind of illusion. And I think scientists and materialists and others, they have a hard time in telling us, for example, that the cat is not real, the dog is not real. They yes. don't have their own reality. And actually, this is what I'm trying to, uh, when I say the object is also a bits, uh, bits and pieces and uh, combinations of dynamics of consciousness, because in the same way as Rupert looking at me is a, is a bundle of consciousness looking from a certain perspective, and I'm assuming you are in unity consciousness <laughs> because you are talking about it in this way, and therefore you see the wholeness, but you still see it from Rupert Spira's perspective, and I see it from Tony Nader's perspective, uh, in a sense, even though we can realize the infinity and the oneness behind it. But I cannot deny your existence as a bundle of consciousness, not separate from the unity value, yet one perspective of consciousness on itself through those eyes of Rupert Spira, Another perspective through those eyes of Tony Nader, a third perspective is those eyes of the cat, those eyes of the dog, those eyes of the elephant, of the tree. Yes. And so we cannot um, neglect or ignore or negate the existence of different perspectives and, and being actually uh, as real, but to a different extent of the dynamics and breadth and depths of consciousness as we are or as different people are. So this is actually an interaction of different perceivers from different limited perspectives, but they are also other perceivers with other different perspectives that are part of the whole game of existence and interaction. Yes. Okay, I think I see it slightly. I'm not sure whether there's a difference just of semantics here or whether there's a real difference between our views. Let, let me let me respond to that, Tony, and then you can tell me what, what, what you think. I would suggest that, that there aren't different perceivers, that what perceives in you or what knows in you, let's keep it to perception, what perceives the world through your sense faculties and what perceives the world through my sense faculties and what perceives the world through your cat's sense faculties and what perceives the world through whatever other mind there may be is the same perceiver, the same consciousness, but it looks through different 
sets of sense faculties and therefore it sees uh, uh, has a slightly different view it's like when you look out of the windows in let's say in your house you have 12 windows you look out of each of the windows the person looking out of each of the windows is the same person but what he sees is slightly different because each window is facing a different direction and has a slightly different shape or size so what i would suggest is that each person's uh, sense perceptions are slightly different and therefore give us a different view on the world. But the actual perceiver consciousness is the same. So literally, the, the consciousness that is seeing the world through your eyes and the consciousness that is seeing the world through my eyes is the same consciousness. Not Absolutely. similar, the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But it has limited itself in a certain way in order to see to from from this actual it individual perspective in just the same way that when you fall asleep in paris and dream that you are on the street streets of oxford your mind hasn't really limited itself tony in the asleep in bed in paris hasn't really become Tony walking on the streets of Oxford. You haven't really limited yourself. You've just localized yourself within your own dream. But the nature of your mind asleep in Paris remains the same, unlimited with respect to the analogy. So I would suggest that although the one infinite consciousness is looking out through each of our eyes now, it hasn't limited itself in the form of each of us, it's localized itself. It, it, it doesn't, it never ceases to be the one infinite con consciousness. It never really becomes a limited consciousness. A limited consciousness arises when we believe that what we essentially are, the one infinite consciousness, shares the limits of our perceiving faculties. In other words, when we believe that the one infinite consciousness is limited to the body mind. This mixture of infinite consciousness plus the body minds makes for this illusory ego or separate self. But when investigated, that separate self is never found. I think it's a little bit of semantics exactly, but okay. because, yes. <clears throat> because we're talking about one unbounded ocean of consciousness, yes. one consciousness, and that's all there is. And there is no question that this is true. Now, it's a semantics in the sense that if you ask a person walking on the street, are you the unbounded limited consciousness? Uh, they tell you, what are you talking about? I'm Mr. So-and-so, and that's all I know. And if you talk to somebody who is, uh, let's say, misbehaving or even a criminal or something like that, you start saying, where is this unbounded limit, uh, unlimited uh, consciousness in that particular individual uh, behaving in such a miserable way? And so you, you can then have a question, not about the ultimate reality of that particular individual, but the relative reality of that particular individual or all of us for that matter, who have not reached that state of unity, what we call unity consciousness, which is the consciousness that recognizes the self as unbounded consciousness and recognize the self and the object as also being unbounded consciousness, which is exactly your description. Uh, and that is the reality in one level of consciousness, one state of consciousness, if you like. Yet, that individual uh, who is sure they are not that consciousness, uh, somehow uh, are in state of what we call ignorance, of course, and that's the difference between ignorance and enlightenment, if, if you like, between uh, boundary and, and freedom, which is uh, moksha, yeah. liberation. And that is, in that sense, in that sense, this ultimate consciousness is looking at itself from different perspectives and as if in order to be true to the different perspectives, it has itself as if within those limited perspectives, 
decided to see from a limited perspective and for all practical purposes, forget as if it is the unbounded consciousness. Otherwise, everybody yes. would be in that unity consciousness, but yes. not everybody is. Yes, I, I think we're on the same page, Tony. C consciousness um, localizes itself as the apparently separate subject of experience from whose perspective it, it views what is really its own activity as the apparently outside world. And in doing so, it, it so to speak, loses itself in the individual. Right. Just like when you fall asleep in Paris, you forget I'm Tony peacefully sleeping in Paris. I've lost myself in my own creativity. So consciousness uh, um, both imagines the universe within itself, localizes itself within it, but gives itself so utterly and completely to that lo localization that the price it pays is, is its knowledge of itself. It seems to forego it, the knowing of its own being in order to, to divide itself into the subject object relationship. So that, that consciousness, uh, we could say that consciousness pays for manifestation with its innate peace. It gives up the knowing of its own being. That's the sacrifice it makes in order to manifest itself as the universe. No, and that I is might... why... uh, Let me just add one small thing to that. Too. That is why in the hearts of all apparently individual selves or finite minds, they're, they're li right at the core of every individual, that there lives this longing for happiness. That longing for the happiness is actually the memory of our original state of unity calling us back to itself. Now, that calling back to itself is, is, is known as grace. The individual feels, I am making the effort to be happy. No, no, the individual doesn't do anything. The individual is an illusion. But what the individual is feeling as my longing for happiness is, in fact, the gravitational pull of infinite consciousness, drawing it back to its original form, its original nature. That is wonderful. Just for our listeners, uh, so they don't misunderstand you, <laughs> that consciousness never loses its peace so that's you know let's say that yes it it adopts different perspectives in order yes. to know itself from all these different perspectives by while adopting these it remains itself unbounded and infinite exactly. so exactly. there is a dual kind of experience there is the experience of i am pure unbounded being which is never lost for that consciousness yes yet there is that dual nature where it accepts to be in those yes. other exactly. individual realities to see from all these infinite realities and yeah. to 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 the way i um, have expressed it in my book one unbounded ocean of consciousness is that this gives actually the reason for manifestation because that's another another problem in, in philosophy, metaphysics and, and, and discussion is why would that unbounded consciousness ever want to manifest or if not to want, why does it actually spontaneously or as a will actually manifest in all of these different entities? And the answer that I've given would like to hear also your point of view is it's almost by necessity of being a consciousness entity that it has to be conscious and to be conscious in all possible ways. And some of the ways are unbounded, infinite, pure being. Other ways are the consciousness of Rupert Spira, the consciousness of Tony Nader, the consciousness of the cat, the dog, and the elephant. And I go as far as saying the consciousness of an atom, the consciousness of a, of an, uh, you know, a table, the consciousness of, you know, to whatever limited value those consciousnesses are. Yes, yes. Okay, F first I just want to comment on what you said uh, originally about remaining the unbounded 
consciousness whilst at the same time localizing itself as a finite mind. It, it's as if you were to fall asleep in Paris, dream that you're on the streets of Oxford, but you were to lucid dream. Right. Consciousness is lucid waking. It, right. it, as you rightly say, it never really overlooks or forgets itself, but it, it, it is simultaneously aware of itself as it essentially is and localizes itself as each of our finite minds through whose perceiving faculties it, it knows itself as the world. So it's like, it's like lucid dreaming when you, when you dream and you know that you're dreaming. You're simultaneously in the waking and dreaming states. So that was just a comment on, on, on again, I'm using an analogy to, 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 to reinforce something you gave a rational description for. But moving on, Tony, to um, the, the, the reason, the purpose. Uh, I would say ultimately there is no purpose. From the point of view of infinite consciousness, I would suggest that the that from the point of view of the finite mind, the finite mind has a purpose for doing everything. Everything the finite mind does, it does it for a reason or for a purpose. And the finite mind, when it tries to think of infinite consciousness, it, it imagines that the qualities that pertain to itself also pertain to infinite consciousness. So the finite mind notices, I have a purpose for everything. And it projects that onto infinite consciousness and thinks infinite consciousness must have a purpose for manifestation. Uh, I would say uh, that, that, that infinite consciousness didn't because infinite consciousness is, is it's unified. It, it, it never increases, it never decreases, it never knows anything other than itself, it never becomes anything. It, that there would be no that there could be no purpose. In other words, what I would say is that to manifest itself through the perspective of a finite mind is it is its nature to do so. Beautiful. It doesn't, it doesn't do so for a reason. The sun doesn't shine for a reason. For a reason, it shines but simply because it is its nature to do so. Beautiful. I, I, I would suggest that that um, consciousness ultimately doesn't have a purpose. Wonderful. That's why I'm, I use the term spontaneously, because, you know, there are... Okay, yes, yes. The idea, I said, like, either spontaneously or uh, intentionally, uh, just to keep the open the door for those who feel... Actually, yes, yes, that okay. There is some kind of meaning to it oh. in, in a specific sense, but it's spontaneous for with a meaning. It's spontaneous with a meaning, which means... Yes. It is its nature to be conscious because we're calling it consciousness. So what is its nature? It's to be conscious and how to be conscious in all possible ways. It has no choice, but in a sense, again, uh, spontaneously as, as we're coming along, we, we are along the same line. I think, yes, yes. Spontaneously, yes. It, it explodes into different ways of knowing itself. And these yes. different ways of knowing itself include, as we said, the cat, the elephant, yourself, myself, and other people are yes. the different ways of knowing. Yes. When you say knowing itself, you don't mean knowing itself as it is. You mean knowing itself as the universe. Right, right. Knowing yes. itself, uh, meaning from different perspectives. What can yes. I know? How can I look at myself? Not asking itself the question, now the, the word. Yes. Because, of course, consciousness... Again, I think we're saying the same thing, but I just want to check because we're using language in slightly different ways. When you say consciousness knows itself through all these different perspectives, consciousness cannot know itself as it essentially is in its original condition through the agency of a finite mind, because the finite mind um, imposes its own limitations on everything that is perceived through it. So right. the infinite cannot know itself via the agency of a finite mind. So consciousness doesn't know itself through the finite mind, but it knows itself as the universe through the finite mind. 
I, I, yes. I think that's what yeah. you mean about just, just, just clearing up a slightly different use of language. When you say consciousness knows itself, when you say that, I understand consciousness knows its essential nature. Right. So I would say consciousness knows itself as the world through the perceiving faculties of a finite mind. Right, right. This, this takes us to consciousness, not only being silent consciousness, but also being within itself dynamic, because that is the process of self-knowing. And I'll take it one step here, and that is, if consciousness is all these finite minds, also, because this is our premise, which means not, not the big consciousness, so let's call it pure consciousness to differentiate. Pure consciousness and relative levels of consciousness, yours, mine, the elephant, everybody else's consciousness. So manifestation is knowing from those different perspectives. So what we're saying is there is pure consciousness which knows itself by itself, I think from the very first moment, in order to know itself by itself, it has to be conscious. It is consciousness, it has to now become conscious in a sense, not in time or space, but to be intellectually, let's say, analyzed as being conscious. Can, can I, sorry, can I just pause you there, Tony, before we, because I want to question you. You said this before and I, I wanted to ask you about it. You, if, I understand, if I understand you correctly, you say that there is consciousness and then consciousness becomes conscious. Is that correct? Now, the term becomes is wrong in the sense that becoming is a process in time and space because you, be, you were something, okay. now you become something. It's okay. not the right term, but we have to use some term okay, to, I differentiate, understand. to differentiate. Yeah. It is spontaneously knowing itself by being conscious. Otherwise, what is consciousness if it's nothing? It's experiencing itself. So when you say somebody's experiencing oneself, you're saying there is an experiencer experiencing something which is the same as oneself. And actually, I take it further to explain some principles in, in ideas of three values in one, be it in the Vedic, Vedantic, or even in the Christian tradition or other traditions, that actually there is a self-reflection which explains certain concepts, which we don't want to go maybe necessarily now into because it takes us to maybe religious concepts which can be discussable in different ways. But when, when there is a process of knowing, because what does it mean to be conscious? It's to know. So you know yourself. Of course, yourself is yourself, but there is a reflection as if you're looking at yourself. There is a self-referral process that's taking place. Yes. From the point of view of the individual, that's true. But from the point of view of consciousness, it's not true. Pure consciousness it's, is flat. Pure consciousness, I would suggest, knows itself simply by being itself. It doesn't need to reflect on itself. However, once it has localized itself or seems to have localized itself in the form of a finite mind, then that finite mind has to reflect on itself to, for, for the recognition, I am infinite consciousness to take place. So the self-reflection is only true from the perspective of the individual. Consciousness doesn't reflect on itself. It just, it's like the sun. It is, the sun doesn't have to turn around and shine on itself. It is self-luminous by nature. I would suggest consciousness is self-aware by nature. Yes, I, you know, this is very important and very good. It's good to have corrected that if that gave the same impression because, you know, we teach transcendental meditation and transcending is to go beyond, beyond, beyond everything, beyond the thought, beyond the mantra, beyond the feeling, beyond memory, beyond existence, beyond time, beyond space, and yet be conscious. And yes. when we say to those who learn transcendental meditation, we say, actually, you are not being conscious of pure consciousness. 
it's pure consciousness being itself transcending any process or any system of uh, of yeah. limited perception and going beyond all limitations into pure being into pure consciousness so in in a sense thank you for for correcting that on that level now from a different perspective um we uh, we can say the process of manifestation if we like to call it that must have a becoming must have a moment of experience a moment of experience from a relative perspective in a sense yeah. and that moment of experience starts with that self reflection on the biggest level where the knower the knowing and the known are the same there is no difference so there is no trinity in reality it's all one yet the concept of three emerges and that is the seed of how the various other aspects start emerging why we we engaged into this it's because of the question knowing itself now knowing itself as pure consciousness is beautifully expressed by you as self luminous self existing but it is also you it is also me it is also the cat it is also the tree it is also the sun now if we say all of these are an illusion a total illusion we get into something that's hard to defend because we are real okay and, can i can i say something are, about that? I, I, let, just let me finish sorry 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 yeah <laughs> it's okay no I, it's fascinating it's wonderful to be with you irrespective of the podcast we just <laughs> yeah, no no yeah, yeah. i'm enjoying this enormously yeah so uh, Carry on. what i want to say is that we are also in our limited perspective we are part and parcel of consciousness in the same way as consciousness has that unlimited unbounded pure consciousness bliss sat chit ananda pure truth pure knowledge pure consciousness pure bliss fully existing self luminous within itself it does not deny that it also knows itself from all these unlimited perspectives which makes those unlimited perspectives part of its dynamic nature and therefore it is not a flat absolute but it is a flat absolute plus its dynamic nature within it that we experience in partial terms in different different ways okay Oh, that's very very interesting let me come back to that i wanted to say something about illusion and reality because you've mentioned it twice now you said earlier on when the sign when we tell the scientists that the world is just an illusion they just look at you as if you're crazy and 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 and, and rightly so i think there's a a, a misunderstanding I, i don't mean it's your misunderstanding i think there's a general misunderstanding that, that people have in, in our culture the way we use language we conflate uh, something that is an illusion with something that is unreal we think that something's an illusion we think it's unreal this is not what illusion means uh, my face you're looking at my face now i am very clearly <laughs> but, but, but actually my face is an illusion you you're not really experiencing my face what are you experiencing if you reach out and touch my face you touch a screen which is nothing like my face at all my face is an appearance of the screen so relatively speaking in the confines of this analogy we can say that the the face is an illusion but all illusions have a reality to them what is the it reality of my illusory face the screen so an illusion is not something that is not real an illusion is something that 
is real, but is not what it appears to be. So I would agree with the Vedantic teaching that the world is an illusion, but I do not think that the world is not real. And, and I struggled with this for 20 years in, in, my, in, in the early years because I was studying and practicing the Vedantic teaching and I was being told all the time the world is an illusion. And I thought this meant the world isn't real. And I thought, what do you mean the world's not real? It, I just cannot say the world is not real. It's my experience of the world is, is real. And then I realized they didn't mean when they say the world's an illusion that it's not real. They mean it is real. It's just not what it appears to be. What does it appear to be? 10,000 things made out of individual minds and matter. What is it really? The one infinite, uh, undefinable, indivisible whole or, or, or reality. So I just wanted to say that because it's a, a very important um, to this relationship between an illusion and un, un, unreality. Let, let um, me respond to that and then yes, go back to yes, that yes. second point. When I, when I speak about it in, that, in these terms, I say that the illusion is to think that whatever you see, you experience, or you live is different than consciousness, than pure consciousness. That is the illusion. It is not different in the sense that okay. it is not a different substance, a different entity, a different essence, a different uh, ultimate reality. It is the same ultimate reality and you see it as different and that okay. is the illusion. All right, again, I think we're just using language in a different way, Tony. I, I would say that even without believing that the world is something other than the ultimate reality. The world, its illusory appearance still exists. In other words, an illusion, the illusion is not simply the belief that the world is other than the ultimate reality. The illusion takes place in our perceptions the world appears as 10,000 things. That appearance continues. The Buddha saw the appearance of 10,000 things. Ramana Maharshi saw the appearance of 10,000 things. That is an illusion. The, so it's not the illusion that disappears, it's the ignorance that disappears. So the, it's the ignorance is the belief that, that, that the world is something other than the ultimate reality. And that's what disappears. So the illusion is more than just a belief. It's the appearance of 10,000 things. So again, it's just a, a, a different way that we use language. I think we, we share the same understanding, but we use the word um, illusion and belief or illusion and ignorance differently. I would suggest the illusion remains, the ignorance goes. Beautiful. In other words, Ramana Maharshi saw the illusion of objects, but he Beautiful. knew their reality. Beautiful. I think to define illusion or, or um, in terms of reality and illusion, uh, we need to go back to the basic uh, paradigm, uh, I think, from my perspective of knower knowing and known. And so when you want to define the known, which is usually the object of knowledge, and that is where the question of illusion is. What do you know about the object? You have to define who is the knower and what is the process of knowing. Because if I look at you from a certain perspective of Tony Nader in a, in a dream state or in a waking state or in an enlightened state is a different perspective. If I look at you uh, and the television, uh, you look in some ways, uh, in some shapes and forms. If I look at you in real life uh, and we are walking or having dinner together, uh, you are all the same object in a sense. Sorry for calling you an object. You are the greatest subject. But <laughs> uh, uh, for me, for anyone who's observing, we call each other the object of my observation. So the object of observation the reality of the object of observation is not dependent only on the object. It depends 
on the subject yes. and the process of observation. Yes. So if if you were to look at reality, you take a, a piece of something and you say it's an object. If you look at it from its essential nature, we are saying it is consciousness. Yes. So who is saying it is consciousness? Well, let's say pure consciousness, looking at it, it knows it's pure consciousness. So it sees it as pure consciousness, yet sees the object, but it sees through the object. It sees through its limitation and defines it as pure consciousness or pure consciousness in a certain, appearing in a certain way. You know, for the cat is different, for the mouse is different, for the human being with a certain level of awareness, it's different. You know, the same flower bouquet can be creating happiness or sadness, depending on the observer. Uh, if somebody is colorblind, they won't see the red, they would see shades of gray, for example, in a flower. So when you say, what is the reality of the object, you have to define the subject yes. and the process by which, which lighting is there, which, you know, we know this yes. in neurophysiology even, it's, it's, it's technically true. And therefore, uh, this is where the illusion comes, is that if you think the object is itself an absolute essence by itself, you are having to say, it is real, it is real for you, but it's an illusion in terms of how you're seeing it. And therefore, it is real if you say it is Mr. X under those conditions looking at this object, then yeah. the object is real. And that yeah. is the reality of Mr. X, might not be the reality of Mrs. Y. And so that is how I think we should define also the sense yeah. of reality. I, I'm with you completely, Tony, that we cannot speak meaningfully of the object in itself, by itself, because the object appears to, or what we know of the object, only appears to us in accordance with the limitations of the perceiving faculties through which we know it. So, and, and you're, you're saying the same thing. So let me again give you an analogy, give an, suggest an analogy that, that is a complement to your rational analysis, that I, the human mind consists of thinking and perceiving. So we could say that, imagine consciousness, the infinite consciousness puts on a pair of glasses. One lens is made out of thinking, the other lens is, it's a, it's a simplistic analogy. One lens is made out of thinking and the other lens is made out of perceiving. Everything that infinite consciousness perceives through those glasses will share the limitations of and appear in accordance with the limitations of thinking and perceiving. Now, thinking and perceiving fragment reality into separate names and separate forms. Therefore, through the, a finite mind, that is through the faculty of thinking and perceiving, infinite consciousness cannot know itself in its original form, in its essential nature, because it's looking through a filter which fragments it and makes it appear as 10,000 things. So the object appears in relationship to the, to the, to the glasses that consciousness is wearing. If consciousness is wearing a, a pair of human glasses made out of thinking and perceiving, consciousness will perceive itself as the world that we know. But if it puts on the pair of glasses uh, a, 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 of a dog's mind or a cat's mind or a flea's mind or a, or a it will see it will see itself in a very different way it will appear to itself differently it will appear to itself as a completely different set of objects but those objects will be as you say directly related to the perceiving faculties through which consciousness is perceiving beautiful and all of these, this brings us back to when I interrupted you, and I, I think you had a comment to do. Uh, all of these are part and parcel. That's how I like to see them uh, of that infinite consciousness playing, if you like, they use in yes. Sanskrit the term lila, or spontaneously being, spontaneously expressing its knowing ability, its 
uh, its conscious ability uh, in all different ways. Yes, and and Tony, would you agree with this that that infinite consciousness by itself cannot perceive a universe? Infinite consciousness by itself. There's no such thing as the universal view of the universe. Infinite consciousness only knows itself. If it wants to know manifestation, it can only do so from the localized perspective of a finite mind. Right. So that's it, why it, that's sorry. why it hides itself in a way. It, 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 that's Otherwise, the, we get I we get into a dualist perspective if we if we. That's so, the sacrifice it makes. Yes, it 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 has to forego the knowing of its own being and consent. temporarily temporarily yeah, i mean temporarily between quotation mark and the sense it, exactly because time only begins when infinite consciousness localizes itself or seems to localize itself exactly as a, as a finite mind so for consciousness there is no time or space time or space seems to begin and only seems to be real from the localized perspective of a finite mind absolutely yes yes and yes. those and those are its own spontaneous, if you like, um, expression of its nature. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. they are the spontaneous expression of its nature to be conscious and to be conscious in all possible ways. One yes. way is to be conscious in the absolute, and it never loses that when it is conscious of this way and that way and the other again the elephant the tree the human being and all of that and so we have in, in transcendental meditation we have a state of consciousness we call cosmic consciousness and what this state means is actually we define consciousness just to make it systematic into the three normal states of consciousness of deep sleep dream and waking and then what we call transcendental consciousness when the person goes beyond everything and goes to allow consciousness, in a sense, through that physiology of ours, to experience itself, which we call transcendence, transcending. And there we know ourselves. We know ourselves directly through direct experience by going beyond. And, and I heard you speak about this beautifully in terms of rather than going out, you know, yes. going in, inside and leaving everything and going to the self. So this is our, you know, also the main approach, technique, transcending. And then what we say is the person gets established in that transcendent and it never leaves them. And what happens is now you come out into activity. So you have to deal with objects and people and situations, yet you never lose yourself. We call this cosmic consciousness. It's kind of a dual awareness, if you like. Yeah, it's not yeah, like yeah. a divided mind. It's much more like yeah. having anchored oneself into oneself, never losing the self, and yes. yet engaged into action. And that's one of the greatest teachings in the Bhagavad Gita. And, and since we're talking about this yeah, on the yeah. battlefield, when Krishna tells Arjuna, who is the the fighter who wants to fight or not to fight and getting into all these situations. And that uh, representation of the absolute, which is uh, in Krishna's incarnation in, in the Bhagavad Gita, that's how it's represented. He tells yes. him, yoga sta kuru karmani, which means established in unity, then perform action. And your action will be based, therefore, on yes. that unlimited, perfect level of stability inside. Which means yeah. there is a duality here of consciousness. One is the unbounded consciousness inside, and the other is the experience of the outer values in the field of action. So I'm saying this because that would resemble that pure consciousness never losing itself, and yet at the same time experiencing reality through Rupert and Tony yeah. and John yeah. and Mary and David and and Elizabeth and, and all of that. Yes. So yes. that is that is the the reality of that consciousness. Yes. Tony, I'm 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 with you. I, I refer to these two these two aspects that you've referred to as, as the inward facing path and the outward facing path. 
I sometimes refer to them as the Vedantic approach and the Tantric approach. As you say, the first step is to transcend uh, the content of experience. I don't think of it as transcending because when we transcend, we go beyond experience. Consciousness lies prior to experience. So I, the, the language of beyond for me, I struggled with this for many years. I was always trying to go beyond my experience. Uh, and I, I, I imagine because of the, the languaging beyond, I, I felt that I had to reach beyond everything I could possibly know to find. I, I didn't realize that, that consciousness, reality lies prior to experience, not beyond it, but prior to it. it, it it's more intimate, more innermost, more. So this is the inward facing path. We trace our way back through the layers of experience. And we, we arrive at the, the pure awareness of being in the absence of objective knowledge. And Nirvikampa Samadhi is sometimes referred to. That's the, that's, the, that's the first step, the unity consciousness that you refer to. But then, and I completely agree with you about this, we then have to turn around we have to go back to the objects which we initially discarded on our way back to our true nature. We discarded, I am not my thoughts, I'm not my feelings, I'm not my sensations, I'm not my perceptions, I'm not my activities or relationships. Neti, 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 neti. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, we, we tra- and eventually we get back to this, our, our core experience, simply the, the awareness of being. But then we have to turn around and, uh, so to speak, um, accommodate everything that we previously rejected in the light of this new understanding. And we recognize, and this is what I think you call cosmic consciousness, we recognize the consciousness that, not, that doesn't just lie behind experience and, and, and as such transcends it, but it, it pervades all experience and indeed is all experience in, in the is everything and so that, that i call these two motions the inward and outward facing path i think you refer to them as unity consciousness is 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 the um, the culmination of the inward facing path you then become established in your true nature and then when you go back out to the world the cosmic consciousness you see everything pervaded by and ultimately made of that universal consciousness Exactly, beautiful. The two passes are like that in a sense. Yes. And just to summarize and maybe reiterate a little bit, we are completely along the same line. Yes. Yeah. The transcending, of course, if going beyond means beyond something major or big outside is one way, but we transcend inward also. Yes. Yes. So we can transcend inward from the mind thinking like the mind is like an ocean active on its surface. Yes. And we say you plunge into the depths of the ocean and yeah, become yeah, the yeah, ocean yeah. and realize yeah. your ocean. And now that you've established yourself and anchored yourself in that being, now you can go out and see yeah. that everything else is also myself. And that's what we call unity consciousness. So that, just, yes. Right. Yes. So first, first, if you're not on a stable grounds, how can you see that the others are also your consciousness and the self. So first establish yourself into yourself, yoga star established in being. And then the next step is actually outward, as you say beautifully, yeah. which takes us to the real understanding of the nature of everything as being consciousness. And since I am consciousness, you are consciousness, everything is consciousness, then naturally this is what we call unity consciousness. Uh, yeah. I am that, thou art that, you know, we know these, these great that you mentioned, you know, the Rumi and other Vedantic expressions, Tatvamasi, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahm, everybody's wholeness, everybody's totality. I am Brahm, I am totality also. Yes, yes. Yes, we 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 see eye to eye, Tony. <laughs> Absolutely. So many things. So many things I'd like to comment on, and and but I, I want to go back to one thing that you said when we were discussing uh, the difference between a, an illusion and something that is unreal. You talked about um, the inherently motionless nature of consciousness, and yet at the same time, 
it must have a dynamic aspect to it. Otherwise, it would not be possible for, for, for the world of movement and change, even if it is only an appearance, there is still something there that appears to move and change. So there must be some dynamic aspect. How, how do we reconcile the, the fact that infinite consciousness never changes and therefore must be motionless, but appears in the form of changes? And again, I'd like to um, suggest an analogy as a complement to your rational analysis. It, it, my face, as you look at my face, my face is moving on the screen now, yes. So if I were to ask you now, is my face moving, what would you say? Yes, from an observation perspective, yes, of, course. of course. If I were to ask you now, is the screen moving, what would you say? Well, the screen from the reference point of my position is not moving, but you exactly. can take a reference point. It, it, of... uh, don't, don't take my analogy too far. Right. <laughs> all, all, I'm, all, I'm, all I'm trying to, to show in, in an analogy rather than a rational analysis that, you see, my ima the, the image of my face and the screen are not two separate things. It's, this, it's one thing. Now, depending on how you look at it, you can, uh, if you look at the, the image, you say it's moving, if you look at the screen, you say it's motionless, but it's the same thing. Now, how can the same thing be both stationary and moving at the same time? So it, 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 it's, it, it's very, it, it's impossible for our mind to conceive of how the, the infinite reality never moves and yet it moves within itself. That they seem to be contradictory statements. Uh, so what I'm trying to avoid is saying that the, the one, the infinite consciousness both moves and is stationary. It's like suggesting it has two different modes. No, it's, it's not like that. That's the mind's limited way of seeing it. That's how the mind sees things. It, its movement and its uh, stillness are the same thing. They're not two different modes of consciousness. Consciousness only has one mode, but it's only one thing. There's no diversity in it. But but from our limited perspectives, it 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 the best the human mind can do. It, it, it's what Jesus said in in the um, Gospel of Saint Thomas when Jesus's disciples say to him, "When people ask us." who you are, what should we say? And he says, tell them I am a movement and a rest. So consciousness is one thing, which is not a thing, of course. And from the perspective of a human mind, it both moves and is at rest simultaneously. <laughs> the, the mind cannot really understand that. Beautiful. I actually use that um, and like to share it with you uh, as a foundation for even thermodynamics and different aspects that we observe in creation. And that is really the oneness of the absolute. Uh, you know, as Parmenides have said, uh, ex nihilo nihil fit, nothing comes out of nothing. And so when you also look at cosmology and physics, now scientists are coming to the point of saying that the total energy of the universe is actually zero. And that at the beginning, it's nothing really in a sense. Um, we don't want to go into that field. Uh, I know when you were asked before about physics, you refused to comment. I'm cautious, so, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we don't want to go into that, whatever interpretations are there. But um, it actually brings a very interesting point. And that is, let's imagine the absolute is one flat, peaceful, which it is, a pure being equal to itself, equanimity all the time, nothing is changing. Now, how can movement come and be non-movement at the same time? The way it will happen, uh, this is a proposal that, <laughs> that I, I'm giving, we can discuss it, is that if you create a plus, you have to create a minus. So when you put plus one and minus one together, you get zero. So uh, 
if you look at the totality beyond space and time and add up everything, although you have all these movements up and down and changes and all of that, the fact that they are always balanced, always equivalent in a sense, whether separated or not, we'll talk about space and time because this is how reality appears. Because it's, if everything is at the same time in the same space, and everything negates everything else, then you get nothing. You stay with nothing. And therefore you have zero, you have you go back to your flatness. But if you separate in time and space, the positive and the negative, then you can see them as separate. But when you look at them all together, if you are stepping beyond time and space, then they, there is no change. And I usually take the example, which I'm delighted you like these examples, uh, and, and you bring them to life, because this is what talks to more people than theory and logic, you know, of um, sound cancellation, sound canceling. So how, when they first did it, I just wondered, how can they cancel the sound? You know, there is sound, and sound is vibration, how they cancel the sound. This, the way they do it, as we know, is there is a little chip or computer, tiny one, that actually picks up the waves of sound vibrating in one direction and actually produces sound vibrating in the other direction. So if there is a wave going up, you create a wave going down, up and down, if they are equal, they cancel each other. And so the sound goes away. So by removing sound, you create sound to remove sound. It sounds, uh, it sounds yeah. illogical, but yeah. this is how it works. And that is really what explains why, for example, you cannot create a positive charge in physics without having a negative charge. If you take a particle and you break it into a positive charge, you have to create a negative charge so that there is always balance between negative and positive. If you have matter, you have antimatter. If you have spinning in one direction of particles, you have to have particles spinning in the other direction. Why is that? You know, why should the universe be like that? And this is really kind of bringing us back to that silent absolute, which accepts to be manifest, or you know, accepts again. We don't want to hold on to terms and terminology, but which manifests dynamism. Yet the dynamism is always balanced in such a way that what appears to be creating noise and imbalance, if you step away and add it all together in the same time and space, it comes back to silence. It's totally silent. And so this is one, one idea <laughs> along these yes. lines of thought. Yes, yes. So it's wonderful. We've taken a lot of your time. It's you've been very generous oh, to be with us. Pleasure. We we could um, we could go on talking for several hours. Um, no, I, I I see Tony. We're coming. Uh, um, we have a slightly different language. Not 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 so different. Just a, a few few terms. And it, and I'm glad that we didn't get stuck on semantics because it's it's tedious to discuss the right. meaning of words. So we 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 we're both fluid enough in our understanding of language to, to to concede each other's use of language and not make it uh, a stumbling block so that that was that was very nice that we were able to do that and but also we i see we our minds work in slightly different ways you're more of a scientist i'm more of an artist <laughs> so we, we we represent these ideas in 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 different ways but it takes it takes very little for us to um converge uh, on on our on our shared understanding. That's beautiful. From my side, I tuned in to to you in a wonderful way. I'm maybe more liberal with my use of language and English, but uh, I I understood you and was delighted Likewise. in your yeah. ex your expressions. Thank you yeah. so much. Any well, last thing? Any last uh, wisdom, word of wisdom, or idea <laughs> you want to share? Or no, we've covered so much, Tony. That that's um. No, I think that's a very, very, it's a beautiful conversation. Thank you. Wonderful. It was a joy for me. So we look forward to hopefully meeting in person. Well, if you ever find yourself in, in London or Oxford, not in a dream, but in the waking state, <laughs> please be in touch and it would be a pleasure to meet you. You got me closer to fulfilling the dream. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, 
Thank you. All the best. Good. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye for now.